Hello, everyone, and welcome. Um, good morning and or good afternoon, depending upon your time of day. My name is Dr. Michael Kaplan, and I had the pleasure of uh, presenting part one of our three-part insulin resistance webinar series two weeks ago. And today, I have the pleasure of introducing to you my colleague, Dr. Pushpa Larson. Dr. Larson is one of our consulting physicians here at Meridian Valley Laboratory. Before she came to work with us, she had a private practice in the Seattle area, at which time she was also a midwife and delivered babies. And now she works with the rest of us um, in the field of interpreting hormone testing, allergy testing, and of course uh, our insulin resistance, uh, glucose tolerance insulin resistance testing that we're going to be talking about today. She's extremely knowledgeable on the subject, and so I leave you in her trusty hands. Without further ado, my colleague, Dr. Larson. Thank you, Michael. Okay. So good morning, and thank you for attending this part two of our three-part webinar. Um, as Dr. Kaplan said, he presented part one a couple of weeks ago, which was about the foundations of insulin resistance, and he presented some really fascinating material on, uh, on contributing factors beyond what we normally think of, like, you know, uh, diet and exercise and that kind of thing. So if you weren't in attendance at that webinar or would like to see it again, it's now archived on our website at meridianvalleylab.com. I will be answering questions at the end of the presentation. Please feel free to write in your questions at any time, but for the most part, I will address them at the end of the webinar. So part two focuses on assessment, testing, and monitoring for insulin resistance. And we're going to be introducing you to a test that really stands head and shoulders above other methods of assessing, assessing insulin resistance. And I'm going to be answering three question, main questions in this section. So what should prompt me to suspect and test my patient? What's the best way to evaluate my patient for insulin resistance? And when I find it, what, other, what else should I do? I first want to return to a couple of Dr. Kaplan's slides from part one. In this slide, Dr. Kaplan touched on six factors that can disrupt insulin response, any one of which may play a role in initiating the development of insulin resistance. So we're looking at the con contribution of adipokines or cytokines that are released from adipose tissue, the role of environmental toxins, disruptions in sleep patterns, mitochondrial damage and dysfunction, the impact of maternal nutrition when the patient was in utero, and the effects of a healthy or imbalanced gut bacteria on insulin and blood sugar regulation. And keeping all of these factors in mind expands the field of possibilities when we're considering whether a particular patient is at risk for insulin resistance. Then considering the comorbidities of insulin resistance, we realize that the presence of atherosclerosis or systemic inflammation in our patients should also raise our index of suspicion for insulin resistance, as well as uh, imbalances in sex hormones, especially among men and to a lesser degree in women. Dr. Kaplan showed you this slide with the National Health and Nutrition Exam Examination Surveys data. That data tells us that more than a third of adults and half of those over 65 have prediabetes, and 70% of those people will progress to full-blown diabetes if things keep progressing as they are. So what does that mean to your practice? In the United States, more than 86 million people have prediabetes. That equates to 417 patients for every primary care doctor in the United States. That number doesn't include naturopathic physicians, nurse practitioners, and other non-MD primary care providers, but there's still plenty of patients to go around. <laughs> 
In Canada, the numbers are similar with 408 patients for every primary care MD. And for these 98 million people with prediabetes in the U.S. and Canada, out of every 10 people, nine of them don't know they have a problem. And as you will see, there are many more people who are insulin resistant who have not yet progressed to prediabetes. Um, and that pro the problem is really so pervasive that good clinical practice demands that we be actively screening our patients for insulin resistance. So let's start with red flags that should alert us to a patient's increased risk or likelihood of developing insulin resistance. Certainly a complete family history that takes into account diabetes, obesity, cardiovascular disease, et cetera, is essential. Um, if your patient's mother had uh, gestational diabetes or did not gain enough weight during pregnancy, that could also put your patient at increased risk. Ethnic differences occur in insulin resistance with greater prevalence among African Americans, Hispanics, American Indians, Asian Americans, South Asians, and Pacific Islanders. Turning to the patient's health history, anything that might signal a disruption of a normal adipokine function is a red flag. Also, toxic exposures through work, diet, and so on can be contributing factors to the development of insulin resistance. Remember the obesogens that Dr. Kaplan talked about two weeks ago? Well, here's that list again, and I'm sure this list is not exhaustive. Any sign of circadian rhythm disruption is a reason to evaluate further for insulin resistance. Dr. Lee is going to talk more about dealing with sleep problems in part three in two weeks. Chronic fatigue, poor exercise intolerance may be signs of poor mitochondrial function. And in women, a history of gestational diabetes or having had a big baby should heighten your surveillance. Last, any history suggestive of an imbalance in intestinal flora would be a reason to check your patient's insulin response. And aside from these general areas of history, there are specific conditions that are associated with insulin resistance and or blood sugar regulation problems. And I'm not going to go into them in, in detail. You can see all of these, and I'm sure this is not an exhaustive list. So moving on to symptoms. There are many symptoms that can be related to insulin resistance and blood sugar problems. My intention here is not to provide an all-inclusive list, but to help us widen our view beyond weight gain, sugar cravings, and afternoon lethargy. Obviously, general symptoms can arise from a variety of causes, but insulin resistance should be near the top of the list of causes to rule out. Here's a few more. I'm sure that some of you out there could add more to this list. Physical exam. Um, this is very important. I cannot count the times Dr. Wright has shared in our doctor's meeting cases in which a good physical exam revealed signs that led him to suspect insulin resistance. And often these were signs that had been missed by previous practitioners who overlooked physical exam. So a body mass index of more than 25. However, if the patient is Asian um, or of Asian heritage, a body mass index of more than 23 should be a red flag. Um, and if they're Pacific Islander, a BMI of more than 26. Waist circumference in men more than 40, women more than 35. Waist hip circumference uh, ratio, rather. Um, more than 9 in men, a 0.9 in men, and more than 0.85 in women. And of course, blood pressure higher than the optimal range. Additional physical exam, um, acanthosis dicercans, is that the kind of darkened skin in the folds that you often see kind of sometimes it's described as velvety. This can be a sign of insulin resistance. Skin tags are associated with insulin resistance. 
and xanthelasma, these fatty deposits around the eyes. All of these can be signs that you should be checking your patient for insulin resistance. Incidental findings on routine lab tests. Now, a lot of these things are pretty obvious. Uh, you know, hemoglobin A1C, higher fasting insulin, certainly high fasting glucose. Um, some things are maybe not so obvious. High serum estradiol in men. Uh, higher than optimal ALT, especially more than 19 in women, um, which is well within the reference range. Again, this is not um, a comprehensive list. Other findings on labs. Many of you are familiar with our 24-hour urine hormone panels, and there are several indicators on this panel that can point to insulin resistance. On this male panel, we compare total estrogens with total testosterone. And the testosterone to estrogen ratio is calculated by dividing testosterone testosterone by total estrogen. In this case, that yields a ratio of 3.3. A testosterone to estrogen ratio of less than 4 is indicative of hyperaromatization of testosterone to estrogen, which is associated with insulin resistance. We don't have a similar ratio uh, for serum levels, uh, but in general, we would want to see estrogens in the mid to mid-range to low normal and testosterone in the mid to high normal ranges. Men who come in complaining about the development of breasts are almost certainly over-aromatizing and should be evaluated for insulin resistance. Also in the 24-hour urine hormone panel, we see high cortisone, cortisol, and their metabolites being suggestive of insulin resistance. On this report, the optimal level for cortisone is 120 to 130 and around 90 to 100 for cortisol. And then these three metabolites, when added together, uh, optimally should be between 5 and 7,000 for women, between 8 and 10,000 for men. When they are higher than those optimal ranges, that may be associated with insulin resistance. Similarly, the cortisol to cortisone ratio, when that is high, um, uh, that suggests elevated 11-beta HSD activity and may also be associated with insulin resistance. In this case, the ratio is so high that it would actually be off the page. And then finally, 5-alpha reductase activity, when it is high, is associated with insulin resistance in both men and women. And these are both representations of 5-alpha reductase activity. One of them ha uh, is representing activity that takes place primarily in skin and adipose tissue, and the second one is primarily in liver tissue space. So on the 24-hour urine hormone panel, we, see, we have a, uh, a constellation of things that, that really suggest PCOS, and we all know that PCOS is associated with insulin resistance. So when you have highish estrogens or estrogen dominance, that's associated with insulin resistance. Or, I'm sorry, that's part of, part of the PCOS constellation. Then low progesterone especially low progesterone in relationship to estrogen. Highish androgens. And then the final part of this constellation is high 5-alpha reductase activity, which I already talked about. So these four things taken together are a pretty good indicator of PCOS, and certainly if you see these in a patient, uh, that would be a good reason to screen them for insulin resistance. Other markers, low estrogen women can be associated with insulin resistance as well as it being too high. Also, many of the other hormones, if they're low, low progesterone, low thyroid hormones, low growth hormone, etc. So what's the best way to evaluate? So if I were presenting this to a, a live audience, well, I guess you guys are live, but I mean a non-virtual audience, an in-person audience, 
I would be asking people, well, what tests would you order? And these are the kinds of responses I would typically, typically get, all reasonable responses, reasonable ways of considering if you saw something um, abnormal with one of these, that that might make you suspect insulin resistance. But there are some limitations with these tests. So with fasting glucose, and this is probably not news to you, you can have people with high insulin, which is keeping their fasting blood sugar quite normal. Um, and so their fasting glucose doesn't necessarily tell you that there may be some insulin resistance going on. Fasting insulin can also be optimal, and it usually is, actually, until insulin resistance is quite advanced. And we'll see that on some of the graphs we'll be looking at later. Hemoglobin A1c may not be elevated if high insulin levels are keeping glucose under control. And then the oral glucose tolerance test, which is kind of the, the standard for assessing prediabetes anyway, um, or it measures sugar, not insulin. And as we'll see, it classifies people as normal even when they have quite advanced insulin resistance. Here are the ADA cri criteria for diagnosing diabetes or impaired glucose tolerance, which is now called prediabetes. But as we can see, these recommendations are designed to detect a condition that is already established, not to address prevention. So is there a test that can provide earlier detection? Well, of course, the answer is yes. That's why we're doing this webinar. So Meridian Valley Lab bases our glucose tolerance insulin response test on the work of Dr. Joseph Kraft, a pathologist who practiced at St. Joseph Hospital in Chicago for 35 years. And he studied patients who had been referred to him for a standard glucose tolerance test to evaluate for diabetes. In his initial study, which was published in Laboratory Medicine in 1975, Dr. Kraft described the results of 3,650 patients who were referred for an oral glucose tolerance test. Based on the uh, oral glucose tolerance test alone, 53% were diagnosed as di diabetic. And this number is not surprising because they were referred because someone was suspecting they were diabetic. So we shouldn't be surprised if it's so, so high. 47% were considered normal. So here are the original 3,650 3, patients divided into diabetic and normal groups. But Dr. Kraft did more than measure glucose. He also measured insulin. And remember back in 1975, it was standard with a glucose tolerance test to measure blood sugar at fasting 30 minutes, one hour, and two hours. And Dr. Kraft extended this testing to three and four hours. And this is what he found. Of the 47% of patients who had been considered normal, only one-third were still considered normal after taking insulin into account. Half of them were now considered diabetic. 14% were considered borderline, and 3% showed an insulopenic insulin response. And we'll talk more about what that means a little bit later. So if we reconfigure our pie chart, we see that really only 15% of the original 3,650 patients were truly normal. Compare the green sections in these two charts, and you can see how many patients may have gone untreated who could have benefited from early intervention. So Dr. Kraft described five patterns of insulin response, one of which has two variants. So Dr. Kraft described the additional abnormal cases as having diabetes in situ, 
I'm sorry, I just had a little pause there. He said that in in situ represents the earliest manifestations of the disease where treatment can make the big, biggest difference. Today we call that insulin resistance, but both names are describing the same phenomena. Okay. So now we're going to look at the craft criteria for craft criteria for the interpretation of insulin response. So these are the, the five patterns we talked about. I talked about. So pattern one is a normal pattern, normal healthy pattern. Fasting insulin is from zero to ten. Dr. Kraft's original criteria, by the way, for normal fasting insulin was less than 30. But in our test, we've adjusted that based on looking at the results over the years and seeing that there are virtually no reports with a fasting insulin of more than 10 with otherwise normal values. And this is also consistent with current thinking that a normal fasting insulin should be less than 10. And some people even say less than 6. So second part of this second criteria here is that insulin peaks at one hour or two hours. The second hour is less than 50. The third hour is less than the second hour. And the sum of the second and third hours together is less than 60. Subsequent hour values are at the fasting range. So here are the results of a 37-year-old female patient with pattern 1 normal insulin and glucose response um, on the GTIR, the glucose tolerance insulin response test. And you can see that insulin peaks at 30 minutes, and all the other criteria for pattern 1 are met. Here are some other examples of results that would be considered pattern 1. The two on the left peak at 30 minutes, the two at the right peak on one hour at one hour, and all four meet all the other criteria for pattern one. Pattern two shows a slightly delayed insulin peak and a delayed turn to fasting levels for glucose. If the sum of the second and the third hour are between 60 and 100, it is classified as borderline. And if the sum is more than 100, it's considered definite insulin resistance. This is a result of a 19-year-old female patient with normal fasting insulin and glucose and a normal two-hour glucose. Her insulin is more than 50 second hour insulin is more than 50, and the second and third hour total more than 60 but less than 100. So this would be considered borderline. Here's some more pattern two graphs. You can see that in all of these, the two hour glucose values are below the 140 cutoff level that would flag them as impaired on a standard two hour glucose tolerance test. In the fourth graph, you can see that the glucose levels actually get quite high before they um, are brought down. But it would be completely missed on a standard glucose tolerance test with fasting and two-hour specimens because by the time you get to two hours, it's less than 140. Pattern 3A has so pattern 3 has an A and a B. Pattern 3A has insulin peaking at the second hour, and this is considered diagnostic for insulin resistance. This is a graph of a 70-year-old female patient. Her fasting insulin and two-hour glucose are all within normal limits. So she would be classified as normal if you were doing just a standard glucose tolerance test. Insulin peaks at 147 at the second hour, and that reveals a well-established insulin resistance. And then the high insulin levels eventually result in glucose dropping to a low of 51 at four hours. Here are some more pattern 3A graphs. These are all from real patients, by the way. In all of these, you can see that the two-hour glucose levels would have been sufficient to classify them as normal according to ADA criteria. They all also had fasting insulin levels of below 10. Here's 
So either of those, either of those tests, if we were using them to as assess for insulin resistance, fasting insulin or a standard glucose tolerance test would classify these individuals as normal, and yet they're all in pattern 3A. Okay, pattern 3B. In this, this is essentially the same as 3A, except it peaks at the third hour instead of the second hour. It is also considered diagnostic for insulin resistance. This 64-year-old pa female patient had normal fasting and impaired two-hour glucose. The insulin peak is at three hours, revealing a prolonged and dramatic rise in insulin as the body tries to deal with a glucose challenge. And this is the first one of all the ones that we've looked at that would be considered abnormal according to AD, ADA criteria because the two-hour glucose is more than 140. And insulin is still elevated at four hours post-challenge. On this pattern 3B chart, you can see that the glucose levels are quite out of control. The person is clearly diabetic but still has an insulin response. This person has impaired glucose control at two hours but well below diabetic levels. This is the graph of someone who would be missed using traditional methods, even though it's pattern 3B. His fasting insulin and glucose are normal, as is the two-hour glucose but the insulin peaks at the third hour. And here's another pattern, 3B, with out-of-control glucose levels. Pattern 4 is characterized by fasting levels of insulin greater than 10. And frequently, glucose levels are also very high. But in this case, we see that a massive outpouring of insulin keeps glucose levels under control. This is a 67-year-old female patient with normal fasting and normal two-hour glucose levels. Fasting insulin is more than 10, but it's still within the range of uh, normal for most standard lab reference ranges. Notice how her high insulin, how high her insulin rises in order to keep her blood sugar normal. Eventually, the high insulin causes her blood sugar to plummet to 42 by the end of the test. And here's some more pattern 4 graphs. All of them have uh, fasting above 10. The last graph has uh, fasting insulin considerably above 10. And notice the third graph. It has normal glucose levels at the two-hour um, two-hour uh, GTT uh, checkpoints. So fasting of less than uh, less than 100 and a two-hour of less than 140. The fourth graph also shows normal fasting and two-hour glucose levels. But look how high the insulin goes. So this really high fasting insulin shoots even higher and manages to keep glucose levels normal, but at what cost to the pancreas and the blood vessels? And the test, well, that was the third one. Here we go. This is a fourth one. And then it ends with a very dangerously low glucose of 23. By the way, this patient had a hemoglobin A1C of 5.7 because her really, really high insulin was keeping her blood sugar levels down. Okay, now to pattern five. This is a low insulin response. Also, we call it insulinopenic. Um, all the tested values for insulin are less than 40. If it's associated with high levels of plasma glucose, it's considered to be an insulin deficiency, probably because of dead or near-dead islet cells. This is a graph of a 63-year-old male patient with diabetes. He has a suppressed insulin response. You can see the, the curve is really not even much of a curve. It's pretty much flat. Um, 
and it and and this really low insulin response suggests why his anti-glycemic drugs were not working to keep his blood sugar under control because he actually was at the point where he needed to go on insulin. And here we see more pattern 5 graphs which all look remarkably similar except for this last one. This pattern is not commonly seen. It may signify someone who's on a low carbohydrate diet who has a diminished insulin response but still maintains good blood sugar control. Uh, Dr. Wright has also seen this pattern associated with gluten intolerance, especially in younger people. Um, we're still investigating the significance of this pattern, especially in people who don't eat a large, low carb diet. But as I said, it's, it's a fairly unusual pattern. Okay, so now that you've seen all the patterns, I want to put the insulin, uh, the insulin curves together so you can really see the progression. So this is pattern one, a normal pattern. Pattern two, slightly delayed, slightly delayed peak. Pattern three, slightly further delayed. 3B, significantly delayed. Now, pattern 4, the peak is actually a little bit earlier, but you can see that it actually, the, where it starts is higher than most of the others. So we're looking with pattern 4 at generally very, very high insulin patterns. And then pattern five down here at the bottom of the graph where um, there's really not much of a response at all. So you can see here how insulin resistance is progressive. And the great thing about this is that we can also see regression with effective treatment and improvement of insulin sensitivity. Now I want to look at this again, but looking at the impact on blood glucose. Now there's two dots there. Um, one is at fasting at 100, so that's where the uh, normal cutoff would be using ADA criteria. So a, a glucose of under 100 at fasting would be normal. And then that second dot is at about 140. So glucose under 140 at two hours on a two-hour glucose tolerance test, a standard one, would be considered normal. And it just that's just reference points so you can watch these curves. And we're going to look at how long it takes here for glucose levels to return to normal fasting levels of below 100. We're looking at the area under the curve here. And the solid lines are insulin, the dotted lines are glucose. So that's a pattern one. That's the normal fasting um, a normal insulin response. Look how short a period of time the glucose levels remain above 100. Pattern 2, the area under the curve is roughly four times the area under the curve for pattern 1, even though the sugar levels don't rise very high. Pattern 3A, the area under the curve for pattern 3A is probably about six times that of pattern 1. Again, they're still below the uh, ADA criteria for the two-hour cutoff. Pattern 3B, the area under the curve is really enormous compared to pattern 1, and yet it actually just comes underneath in this particular curve, it just comes underneath the uh, ADA criteria. Okay, pattern four, glucose starts high and the area under the curve continues to grow. And then pattern five, with very little insulin to keep things in check, glucose levels really soar and so does the area under the curve. Okay, I'm going to look at a case study. Now, I've kind of given you some little bits of pieces, but here's one complete case. So this is um, a 38-year-old woman. She came into the clinic with, last year with a chief complaint of easy weight gain and fatigue. 
She had a history of gestational diabetes and a family history of type 2 diabetes. She's 5'4", weighed 174 pounds at the initial visit. Her BMI was 29.9. Pulse and respirations were normal. Her blood pressure was normal. Initial lab found fasting blood sugar of 111, but hemoglobin A1C was really quite good at 5.3. Um, but because of the family history and the personal history um, of gestational diabetes, a four-hour glucose tolerance insulin response test was run. And this was her, uh, her graph. So on the GTR test, her fasting uh, glucose was actually quite good. It was 83, and her two-hour was 113, both well within the limits of normal based on American Diabetes Association criteria. Her fasting insulin was 11.8, so just above the 10 point, but it peaked in the second hour. Whoops, let me go back. It peaked in the second hour at 93.2, and this is a pattern for insulin response. So she was put on berberine um, and counseled about diet and exercise, and she was very highly motivated because of her pattern for a result. At her six-month follow-up visit, she had lost 9 pounds, her BMI had come down to 28.3, and her hemoglobin A1C was even lower than the original one at 5.1. Her GTIR test demonstrated a really dramatic reversal from the original pattern 4 result to a completely normal pattern 1. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit about the test. There are two testing options. One is the traditional venipuncture where you draw, draw blood, and now we're introducing um, a new blood spot test, which we're very excited about. Uh, this blood spot version of the test has been in development for more than two years. We're very excited to make it available to a wider group of practitioners for whom venipuncture is either inconvenient or just not possible. It can potentially be used by patients at home, but we're not recommending this unless the patient has someone responsible to assist them, not only with um, collection, but for safety reasons. Both versions of the test require the same patient preparation and number of specimens. Um, these are the test logistics. I'm not going to go into them because there are, uh, in the interest of time, and because you have really complete uh, collection instructions in the kit. Speaking of the kit, um, the kits come with 100 gram glucose drink, um, the blood spot kit contains six pre-labeled blood spot cards along with supplies needed for each finger stick, and the venipuncture kit includes the necessary blood tubes. And both kits include free shipping back to Meridian Valley Lab. You also get, like I said, complete collection instructions. And you get your test board report back within 7 to 10 working days, um, and that's what it looks like. And we identify the pattern, we graph it out, and we identify the pattern for you. You also get an interpretive guide which kind of reviews some of the information I've already talked about in this webinar. We really want you to make, be able to make the best use of your results. So as with all Meridian Valley Lab tests, we offer a free consult with every test. We do our best to fit in last minute and next day consults when we can, but we do tend to fill up. So scheduling several days in advance will give you the best likelihood of getting a time that works for you.
The feedback that we get from our clients is that our consultation services are a great added value to all of our tests. So, because we're so excited about introducing this new test, uh, we're making a special offer to attendees of this webinar for a single test which you can use for yourself or for a patient for only $79, which covers uh, the cost of the kit and shipping. And that's a pretty good value, saves you $120. Um, this special offer is only available for participants at this live webinar and it must be redeemed by April 30th of this year. The regular introductory value pr uh, price for the blood spot test is $199. Okay, so once you have evaluated your patients and you found that they have insulin resistance, what other tests might be appropriate or helpful? Well, certainly for monitoring, um, hemoglobin A1C can be useful. Uh, fructosamine has limited value because it is affected by a number of different factors, but it can be useful in some instances to monitor response to treatment. A repeat GTIR after six months of treatment can be very useful in determining further treatment and also in motivating your patient. You know, this, the, the case study that I presented earlier, this woman was just like over the moon ecstatic that the work that she had done, even though she hadn't lost a huge amount of weight, had reversed her insulin resistance from type 4, I mean uh, pattern 4, to all the way to pattern 1. Um, inflammatory markers are also important if you already don't have baseline levels. Homocysteine is another one that might belong in here. Adipokines, at this point I'm not convinced of the clinical utility of these. I always like to have more data and I love having baselines, but I don't yet see how measurement of adipokines would improve my assessment or treatment options. Blood viscosity, on the other hand, I do think is important to evaluate. This is because blood viscosity, which is critical to perfusion and oxygen delivery to every cell in the body, is very strongly correlated with insulin resistance and metabolic syndrome. In this study of 1,400 people, 35 to 59 years old, they were divided into quartiles by viscosity, and metabolic syndrome was highly associated with the highest levels of blood viscosity. Blood viscosity also predicts the development of type 2 diabetes. This was a prospective study of uh, more than 12,000 initially non-diabetic adults from 45 to 64 years. They were divided into quartiles by viscosity, and those with the highest viscosity were much more likely to develop diabetes. There are many more studies I could show you on the relationship between blood viscosity and blood sugar regulation, but that's beyond the scope of this seminar. However, it is important to know that blood fluctuations in blood sugar are a major contributor to high blood viscosity. If you want more on blood viscosity, there is a two-part uh, webinar from Keep Compounding Pharmacy uh, that was done last summer. It's archived on their website, or you can call us for more information. So what other testing might be important? Well, if you're looking for causes of inflammation, you might want to look at food sensitivities, um, check antibodies, see if someone uh, may have some kind of an autoimmune condition going on. Certainly evaluating gut health and gut flora is important. Sleep studies are probably not necessary for most patients, but might be something to consider. And certainly checking for environmental toxicity may be an important part of assessment. So, in summary, Traditional methods of assessing blood sugar dysregu dysregulation miss many individuals. So we've seen that the traditional methods miss a great many people until those people are actually pre-diabetic or diabetic. And this is years after most intervention would be, intervention would be most useful. And remember, out of every not 10 people who have pre-diabetes, 
nine of them don't even know it. Early detection does not just mean testing. It also means being vigilant for clues that suggest our patients might be at risk for developing blood sugar dysregulation in history, in physical exam, and in lab results. And using the glucose tolerance insulin response test to detect problems at the earliest possible stage when we can do the most about them. So, Earlier detection leads to earlier and more effective treatment, potentially reversing the progression to type 2 by diabetes, and we can just say that road is closed. If you want more on GTIR, there is a, uh, an article in the Townsend Letter of January of this year, and I think we also have a link to that article on our website. Okay, and we will take questions now. And I see the first question I have up here is, um, we always get this question, that we should be prepared for it. Uh, we should tell you ahead of time. Yes, the PowerPoint and the recording will be available uh, after, after the webinar. We'll have the, web, the uh, uh, video uploaded probably by tomorrow. And uh, we'll have PDFs of the PowerPoint slides uh, available by Monday, and uh, so we should just call customer service. Yes, I'm sorry, I'm just checking with one of my one of my colleagues here. Yeah, if you just call uh, customer service and ask for the PowerPoints of the uh, webinar, uh, they will be happy to send those out to you. Okay, and. Let's see, what other questions do we have here? Is the blood spot version of the four-hour test as accurate as a serum test? Oh, yes, it is. We have been, uh, like I said, this has been in development for uh, two years or more, and uh, we've done a lot of side-by-side -side testing, a lot of um, uh, validation of it. I mean, I don't know all the technical part. We have we have uh, some really great scientists who do that, but yes, it is definitely uh, as accurate, and we wouldn't have released it if it weren't. Okay, it says, when doing the GTR test, how is that done logistically? Is the patient in the office for four hours? Can the patient leave? How do you envision doing this, and is it done logistically, and is and how is it done logistically in the office? Well, what we do here, because we, um, we have it set up, so we have a couple of uh, easy chairs, recliners, where pa patients can sit. We, don't, we ask them not to leave and go walking around. Um, we don't want um, changes in exercise to, uh, to affect, how, uh, ha affect the results of the test. So, and we also want to make sure that they're safe, that their blood sugar isn't dropping too low. Um, so we ask them to stay and uh, yeah, they bring their they bring a book or an iPad or or whatever, and and we make make it comfortable for them. Uh, in terms of the blood spot, it's the same, really the same with the blood spot uh, or the vena puncture in ter in that respect. Um, the if you do have a patient who's doing it at home, as I said, we would really recommend, highly recommend that they have someone with them who not only can assist them with the collection, but also um, someone who can make sure that they are staying conscious. As you saw in some of those reports, some people's blood sugar dropped very, very low. And uh, although it's very unusual for us to have um, have someone who actually passes out. I don't. I don't know that I've ever seen it, but we do have people who get a little woozy, and we want to make sure people are staying safe. So if you're having people do it at home, make sure they have someone with them. Um, okay. Let's see. Next question. Yeah. So is the patient in the office for four hours? Yeah. Generally, they are. Um, 
if a, if a patient can do only some of the blood spots, then has too low blood sugar, can they get a discount on the test for fewer samples submitted? No, I'm sorry. Um, I would say don't send it in at that point um, and, and retry it. Um, maybe making sure that they have had a good protein meal the day before, that they were well nourished the day before. Um, like I said, we don't very often, almost never do we have someone who is unable to complete the test. Okay, let's see. What number, oh, the number for customer service is 206-209-4200. And we also have a an 800 number, which I don't have handy, but if you look at any of our materials uh, or look on the website, you'll see our 800 number. I think it's actually 888 or something like that, but it's a toll-free number. Okay, in a patient with normal, no prediabetes, uh, with normal A1C, what clinical clues would you suggest for further testing? Well, um, like I said, a really good history. Um, and really looking for things like sleep problems, um, anything that might be increasing inflammation. Um, uh, oh, something I think I, I think it was on the list of, uh, of things, of symptoms to look for, but I don't know that I mentioned it specifically, early, early osteoarthritis. Uh, we did a, um, a small study here in the Tahoma Clinic, uh, Dr. Sherman did that, looking at people with osteoarthritis um, and, uh, and found a correlation when he treated their insulin resistance. So people who had osteoarthritis and insulin resistance or even uh, prediabetes. And when he treated that, they had improvements in their arthritis, many of them. Okay, let's see. How many drops of blood per testing period? Well, it's a lot of finger poking, but much less than if the patient were to um, have to test their blood sugar daily. Um, so you have, so with each finger stick, you are doing five drops, five drops on the card, and then, and then you do one card for fasting, 30 minutes, one hour, two hour, three hours, and four hours. So the six times five, so 30 drops. But like I said, a lot less than if somebody is doing um, daily blood sugar testing. Can the blood spot GTR test be useful in patients with diabetes on insulin and metformin? Yes, for people with metformin, not necessarily for people with insulin. And how often should I run the BSGTI or test on my patients? Well, I would say that uh, certainly if you have any reason to suspect it, I would do a baseline. And then if, the, if a person has a normal test, then I would say, and nothing else is changing in their lives, then I would say, you know, every two to three years. But if, you, uh, but if there are problems, so if you either see signs that suggest insulin resistance, even if they have an initial normal test, you might want to do it more often, maybe once a year. If you have somebody who has a problem, then I would do it like six months after treatment and see how they're progressing. Let's see. How does one order the test and get the discount after attending this webinar? Um, if you call into customer service um, and tell them that you attended the webinar, they will send you a special um, a special uh, uh, requisition form that will include the discount on that, and also your test kit. Um, and that number again is two zero six two zero nine four two hundred. How many drops of blood are needed to fill up one of the circles on the card? One drop per circle. You want to have a nice big 
big fat drop of blood and then one drop per circle. We don't actually want you to use multiple drops. Um, that affects the results. How often have you seen normal A1Cs and or fasting insulin with abnormal GTR tests? Oh, quite often. I mean, I can't give you a, a percentage, but uh, you saw a lot of charts on there for people who had um, a lot of charts for people who had um, normal fasting glucose and a normal two-hour glucose and normal fasting insulin. I didn't have A1Cs for all of those people because not, not all of those are patients that are in-house. Um, but uh, certainly we see uh, normal fasting insulin quite often. As a matter of fact, it, it doesn't become pattern four until the insulin is abnormal. So all of those earlier patterns have a normal fasting insulin. Let's see, I want to just make sure that I have gotten to all of the questions I have asked here. Okay, here's one more here. Can you summarize the initial lab findings that should trigger me ordering the test? Well, like I said, anything that, um, you know, uh, an elevated hemoglobin A1C, um, certainly an elevated fasting sugar um, or fasting insulin, but like I said, none of those things by themselves, um, if they're normal, rule out insulin resistance. Um, I would be probably looking at inflammatory factors, um, you know, C-reactive protein, fibrinogen, if you happen to be doing those tests. Um, and like I said, there are a number of things on the 24-hour um, urine hormone profile. I talk about those with people every day, and, and um, it's very common for us to see things and say, oh, this looks like maybe there's some insulin resistance going on here. You should take a look at that. Um, I think that's pretty much it. When you get the slides, you can go back and take a look at them, um, see if I missed anything. Does fasting insulin have any utility at all for routine screening purposes? Um, I would say only if you're only interested in making sure that your patient has not yet advanced to type to pattern four. If you're interested in catching them before pattern four, then it doesn't have a whole lot of utility. I know that's not the standard belief. We usually think that a low fasting insulin is fine, but it turns out it's not necessarily. Okay. So thank you. I think we're going to wrap it up now. Thank you all for participating in this webinar. If you haven't already seen part one with Dr. Kaplan, it's in our archives. I highly recommend it. Also, be sure to register for part three with Dr. Mi Jung Lee for two weeks from today if you haven't already done so. She's got some really great uh, strategies for addressing insulin res resistance. And please feel free to call us with any questions you have about the GTIR test or any other Meridian Valley Lab tests. We are here to serve you and signing off now.